This week, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Ashish Naidu of Biola University's Talbot School of Theology. Listen to this message as he teaches on the portrait of happiness from Psalm 1. Declaration this morning. So if you brought your Bibles, I'd like you to please hold your Bibles high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His Word, and I live by His Word. Christ is my Master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, I just request you to please remain standing. You can turn around, say hi to the people around you, in front of you, shake hands, give them your name, and give them a good smile. All right, if you can remain standing. This morning, we are delighted to have Dr. Ashish Naidu with us. Uh, he is uh, an associate professor of theology at uh, Baylor University Talbot School of Theology. Uh, he has an MA uh, degree in theology from All Roberts University, and he has a PhD uh, in theology from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, he, his area, inter areas of interest include historical and systematic theology, uh, uh, particularly exploring the historical theological foundations of our Christian faith. Uh, in addition to contributing to several publications regularly and uh, teaching not only in the seminary but also in other uh, sit uh, sit situations, he also travels and, uh, on missions and, and teaches God's Word in different places. So he was coming to India uh, as part of his missions work in India, in North India, and so it kind of really fit well. Uh, he came and he spent the last three days with us at church camp, uh, ministering to us. Uh, God's word is well received, and uh, we are delighted that he's also with us this morning. So, let's put our hands together and welcome Dr. Asis Snyder. Well, good morning. Once again, what a pleasure and a delight it is to be with APC Church. Um, I was here in June for a brief visit and got to visit you guys for the first time. Um, and of course, I spent uh, the weekend with uh, the APC Church camp and I really was blessed. I was ministered by your uh, humility and your, and your Christ-likeness and your compassion and your warm welcome. So I'm so grateful to be here. I'm really humbled uh, by your graciousness and your warm welcome. Please turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 to be precise. Psalm 1. Let us hear the word of God. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray briefly. Heavenly Father, as we come in the stillness of your presence, we ask for your grace and your wisdom. We ask that by your spirit that you enable us to hear what you have to say to us. Help us, Lord, to focus on your word. Banish every trivial thought from our 
minds. And help us, Lord, to glorify you in your presence as we hear you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, there was a very famous song called Happy. Some of you might have heard of Pharrell Williams' song, Happy, right? Won the Grammy Award. And instantly, it was a major hit, almost in every country, even in Australia. <laughs> Number one, no points for guessing why that song was a hit. I mean, it's catchy. It's a great tune. Very technically sound. But also, I think there's something about the lyrics in that song that kind of capture this longing of human hearts across the world that people are looking for happiness. They're longing for happiness. They're trying to find happiness in different ways. Oh, if I can only marry that woman or that man, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only buy that house, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only get that promotion, that job, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only have that car, I'll be happy. See, many people have different ideas in terms of what will give them happiness. In fact, you know, living in America, one of the most common quotes that is often proffered when people talk about happiness is often referred to as the American dream. It comes actually from the American Constitution. The Declaration of Independence says this in the second paragraph. We hold these things, it says, to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? It's called the American dream. See, the American Constitution promises that as long as, you, as long as you live within the boundaries of its land, you can pursue happiness. But it never guarantees that you will actually achieve it. Yet, people are longing after happiness. They're longing after happiness. They're looking for happiness in different places, in relationships, in things, in possessions. Trying to find happiness in places of prominence, perhaps. Only to be dismayed. There's a recent poll, uh, just about a year ago, that was conducted in the US asking a very simple question. Are you happy with your job? And you know what the results were? 70% of Americans said they were unhappy with their jobs. That's seven out of 10 people in America who said they are unhappy with their jobs. Another research uh, poll suggested that many people are unhappy with their lives as well. Story told of a little boy who pestered his parents for a Christmas gift. Since summer, since July, August, he started to pester his Dad, Mom, I want this gift. I want this gift. And what? Christmas morning came and he opened that gift and he was so joyful so happy that he got what he asked for. He played with it for some time, enjoyed the thrill of it, and after 20 minutes, the novelty of that gift wore off. So he went to the window, looked out of the window, and he saw a little boy flying a kite. And he said to his dad, Dad, can I have a kite like the little boy? It's amazing, isn't it? Happiness is such a fleeting thing, especially if you place the value of happiness in possessions or things or even relationships. You will never find happiness by pursuing happiness. According to the Bible, happiness is a result of another pursuit, the pursuit of God. How did Jesus put it in Matthew 6.33? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be 
given unto you. Happiness, according to the Bible, is a result of another pursuit, seeking Jesus and his kingdom. The book of Psalms is one of my favorite books. In fact, if I were to take a quick poll here by the show of hands, chances are 70% of the audience would say the book of Psalms. The fourth century church bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, commenting on the Psalms said this, and he said it so beautifully. He says, while all of scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. While all of scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speaks for us speak for us. The book of Psalms is right smack dab in the center of the Bible. Have you noticed? It's like a literary sanctuary, a prayer room, a chapel where you and I can come to God in praise and prayer and lament. It describes every possible emotion for us, doesn't it? It describes every longing that we can have. And you can see when you read the book of Psalms why it's so attractive. Because we have godly men and women coming to him in prayer and praise and lament and giving thanks. So the Psalms show us God as he is. They lead us to God and they bring us to Jesus, right? The Psalms lead us to God. They show God as he is and they bring us to Jesus. And that's basically the basic idea that I'm going to be using as I unpack Psalm 1 for you. So first of all, why this talk about happiness? Why this talk about happiness? Have a look at the very first word in Psalm 1 1. What's the word? Blessed. In the Hebrew, the word blessed actually is better translated happy. Ashray is the word. Ashray is happy. And this has got to do with the idea of experiencing God's shalom in every area of our lives. God's shalom in every aspect of our lives, right? This is the idea of the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. Right? So the whole idea here is experiencing God's shalom in our lives. Shalom in our marriages. Shalom in our work. Shalom in our relationships. Shalom in everything that we do. That's what happiness is all about. So this psalm is all about happiness. So I've entitled the sermon, The Portrait of Happiness. The Portrait of Happiness. So let's take a look at Psalm 1-1. Here we have a very beautiful description of a happy person. Look at verse 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The happy person is described by what he refuses. Everyone say refuses. By what he refuses. Number one, what does he refuse? He refuses bad counsel. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. He refuses bad counsel. Now, there's a famous saying that goes this way. There's two quick ways to disaster. Take everyone's counsel or take no one's counsel. Right? There's some people say, no, 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 I don't want any counsel. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Others who seek everyone's counsel, they'll go to every Tom, Dick, and Harry and get a counsel from them. There's a U European proverb that goes this way. If you build according to everyone's counsel, you'll end up with a crooked house. Right? So two quick ways to disaster. Take everyone's counsel or take no one's counsel. Derek Kidner, the Old Testament commentator on the Psalms, says it so well. He says, what shapes your thinking shapes your life. What shapes your thinking shapes your life. Whose counsel are you listening to? Is your life being shaped by the word of God? Or is your life being shaped by the world out there? Who is speaking to you? What are you allowing to influence you? Because what shapes your thinking shapes your life. Whose counsel are you listening to? Are you listening to God's counsel revealed to us through his word and through his spirit? Or are you listening to the world's counsel? Secondly, we notice the happy person is described by the bad company that he avoids. He does not stand. Look at verse uh, uh, verse 1b, uh, 
and he does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. You know, we live in a day, an age, where Christians are mocked almost everywhere you go, whether it be east or west, north or south. Christians are mocked. The seat of the mocker is a very popular seat today. Look at how people think our view of marriage is sanctity of marriage. What is that? Marriage is what gives me ultimate pleasure. Sexuality? No. Sexuality is what gives me ultimate pleasure. Gender? I define gender as I see fit. The sacred institutions of marriage, family, sexuality, gender, even life are questioned. They mock our perspectives about reality and life and about God's institutions that he's given us. The seat of the mocker is very, very popular today. The happy person is described by what he refuses. He refuses bad counsel. He refuses bad company. Secondly, the happy person is described by in what he revels. In what he revels. What does his delight in? Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, what? He meditates day and night. He meditates day and night. The happy person finds pleasure in the word of God. His delight is in the law of God. I heard a pastor not too long ago who said he was sitting next to a passenger and as soon as the plane took off, he took out a book and he began to uh, work in that book and he noticed, he glanced and the book was a password, uh, a crossword puzzle book. Right? And uh, as uh, the journey continued, uh, the pastor looked at the gentleman next to him and said, hey, uh, so looks like you really enjoy password puzzles. Yeah, yeah, I love crossword puzzles. I have a knack for them. I see patterns and words and I can quickly solve a crossword puzzle. In fact, did you know that the first thing I pack when I travel is my crossword puzzle book? And the pastor was convicted as he heard this passenger. Do I do that when I pack my belongings and I'm about to travel? Is the Bible the number one thing I pack? Is my delight in the word of God? This man's delight was in crossword puzzles, crossword puzzles and in that he delighted day and night. And God spoke to that pastor through this very interesting encounter. Is the word of God something you delight in? It's amazing, isn't it? The, the word, the law of God, in, in Hebrew, as you know, the word Torah is, simply means teaching, but it also has the idea of a javelin. It's a picture of a javelin, right? So in the Old Testament, the, the, the picture of God's word is that of a javelin. What happens when you throw the javelin? It hits the mark. It gets the job done, so to speak. In the New Testament, we have the picture of a sword, right? The word of God is like a sword that pierces the very, very inner recesses of our soul. Look at how beautifully Psalm 19 verses uh, 7 through 11 describes the word of God or the law of God. Look at how he puts it. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward." Blessed is a man who delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law, what? He meditates. What is meditates? Meditation is simply slowing down to relish God's word. And allowing God's word to nourish our souls. Slowing down to relish. In fact, the Hebrew word picture is that of a low moaning of an animal as it chews its cud. It's not a very appetizing picture, but... That's the picture in Hebrew. Is that of a low moaning animal chewing its cud. I enjoy fishing and I enjoy grilling barbecue. So sometimes on a weekend, and I don't do this very often, um, 
I gave a break to my mother-in-law and my wife. And I said, you guys don't have to cook this evening. I'm going to barbecue. So I uh, barbecue whatever meat there is, you know, chicken or beef or what have you. And my daughter loves a particular kind of barbecue sauce. And every time I grill it, she wants me to put that barbecue sauce on the meat. So 10 minutes before the cooking is done, I take her favorite barbecue sauce and I glaze the drumsticks, chicken drumsticks, with the barbecue sauce and put it back on the grill. And of course, all, that, all those sugars caramelize and you will notice the aroma of that barbecue spreading everywhere. The neighbors looking over the fence to see who's barbecuing. Sharon is eight years old now and she loves barbecue. I love watching Sharon enjoy the barbecue I make. Daddy, you make the best barbecue. And the way I know I've done a good job is when she takes that chicken drumstick and she relishes it. She chews on it. Mm, nom, 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 nom. Nom, 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 nom. That's what meditation is. You're saying num num to the word of God. You're slowing down to relish what God is saying to you and letting the word of God nourish your soul. Have you noticed very often in our devotional times you read the scriptures and very quickly run to prayer. You skip the vital step of meditation. The gateway to a closer communion with God is meditation. Do you want your prayer life to be transformed? Then meditate on the word of God. As you're reading the word of God, slow down. Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. You make me down. You lay, lay me down in green pastures. You restore my soul, Lord. What, are you, what have you done? You're slowing down, applying the word of God to your heart, relishing every word and letting that word of God nourish your soul. That's what meditation is. Meditation is slowing down to relish, to enjoy, savor the word of God and letting it speak to you and nourish your soul. Right? So meditation is a gateway to a closer communion with God. If you want your prayer life to be transformed, don't skip the vital step of meditation. Read the scriptures, meditate, and then pray. Look at how it will change your prayer life. So blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor in the seat of, stands in the way of sinners, nor, seats, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The happy person is described by what he refuses, secondly, by what he revels in, thirdly, by what he resembles. Thirdly, by what he resembles. <clears throat> he is planted, verse 3, by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. In all that he does, he prospers. And of course here we have something very insightful given to us, a beautiful picture. The blessed man or the happy man is like a tree. Not a stump, but a tree that's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. So what we have here is stability and growth. It's a tree that's planted which has deep roots and therefore it is secure in terms of its nourishment. It can expect nourishment and, it, and it can expect growth, so to speak. So the tree that's planted by the streams of water represents stability, stability. The happy person is a person whose roots go deep and connect with the life-giving source, so to speak. John 15, 4, you probably were thinking of that passage. What does Jesus say? Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you what? Abide in me. Abide in me. So our roots have to go deep and connect with the life-giving source. And who is that life-giving source? Jesus Christ. Abide in me. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Secondly, we also notice this is a tree that's not only planted, but what? It yields its fruit 
in due season. It yields its fruit in due season. What, that, what does that tell you? It means that there'll be seasons in life. It's not always spring, you know. There'll be times of dryness. There'll be times of drought. There's winter. But this tree is secure. Why? Because it has deep roots to the life-giving source. And therefore, it's nourished. Right? It's stable. Right? It has nothing to fear when difficulties come. Why? Because it has deep roots. A tree planted by the streams of water, it will yield its fruit in season. And its leaf also will not wither. So deep roots and connection to life-giving streams give it vitality and productivity. It will yield its fruit in due season. And we can be assured of that. Because of our vital connection with Jesus Christ our Lord, we can be assured that the Spirit of God will work in us to bear the fruit at the right time and manifest that fruit at the right season, as it were. Secondly, in all that he does, he what? Prospers. And of course, your prosperity here has got to do with mature and complete bearing fruit in due season. Right? In other words, the point is, whatever this person does, the righteous person does, will not be in vain. Your work will not be in vain. Everything that you do will prosper. God will bring that work to completion. It may be a small task. Perhaps you're not seeing results right now. But hang on. It's Friday. Sunday is coming. Seasons. Seasons. Everyone says seasons. It's not always spring. There's summer. There's seasons of dryness and drought. There's winter. But spring is coming. Spring is coming. He will bear fruit in due season. And all that he does he will prosper. You will be fruitful. You will be fruitful. Your work is not going to be in vain. Right? Your work is not going to be in vain. So a happy person is described by what he refuses, what he revels in, by what he resembles, and verses 4 through 6, by how he, he is regarded. By how he is regarded. This psalm is a very unique psalm. It's an antithetical psalm, meaning... The first three verses describe a particular person and a particular way of life. The last three verses describe a particular person and a particular way of life. In fact, you can see the contrast right away. Look at the first word. What's the first word? Blessed. What's the last word? Perish. Two ways, two lifestyles, two choices, as it were. If you want to really see the difference, look at the results of these two lives by comparing the first word and the last word. Blessed. Blessed versus the word perish. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff. Chaff that the wind drives away. It's a very powerful picture, isn't it? What is chaff? Chaff is nothing but husk that covers the grain, right? Have you ever seen people winnowing grain? They throw that wheat or grain up in the air, right? And the wind, what? blows away the chaff. It's amazing, isn't it? The wicked person is described as someone who is blown away by the wind. Chaff. Chaff. There's no stability there. There is no permanence there. It's, all, it's basically in passing. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul describes the life of these Ephesian Christians before they came to the saving knowledge of Christ. How does he describe it? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Talking of unbelievers, Paul says, You were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. And you walked according to the course of this world. Chaff. The wicked does not follow the law of the Lord he does not delight in the law of the Lord. He does not revel in the law of the Lord. He despises the law of the Lord. And of course, he mocks the word of God. And therefore, the wicked will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. 
It's a very moving video I saw uh, a, little, a couple of years ago. It's a sad story where this Miami judge was going through her day, you know, uh, hearing cases and making judgments, pronouncing judgments, when in the, I think, midday or so, a person was, uh, a criminal was brought before her and uh, she was listening to uh, uh, the case being made and the prosecuting attorney was basically saying what's wrong with this person and what he did. And as um, the prosecuting attorney was talking, she looked at this criminal standing in the dock and she was transfixed on him. And as the prosecuting attorney was talking, it's all in film. She says, wait a minute. Sir, did you go to Nautilus High School in Miami? And the man said, uh, yes. She says, do you know who I am? My brother and I used to play football with you when we were in middle school. And then he recognized her. And he began to bawl and cry. Oh goodness, oh goodness, oh goodness. The story was this. This man who was arraigned before this judge was her senior in middle school, a close friend of the family, and they all used to play in school. This student, this, this criminal, was a promising student very good with languages, very good in his studies. He was a star athlete in school. Everybody loved him. Sadly, this man made very poor choices and became a criminal. So this judge looked at him and says, I'm very sorry to see you in this state. I'm very sorry to see you in this state. And of course, she, she, she did not bail him out. She set a bail for $50,000 because of his criminal activity. Sorry to see you in such a state. Choices, choices. Two lives, two choices. The way of the righteous, the way of the wicked. The way of the righteous will endure forever. The way of the wicked will perish. A father wanting to teach a lesson to his children took his two boys to a riverbed. He stuck his hand into the water and took out a stone. What do you see? We see a rock. What kind of a rock? It's wet. The rock is wet. So he knelt down and he broke that rock into two. And he took those two pieces and he looked at his sons and says, what do you see in here? Bone dry. Wet on the outside, but what? Bone dry on the inside. How many people are like that? some of them in church, surrounded by good, godly preaching and teaching, surrounded by good praise and worship music, surrounded by great Christian fellowship, surrounded by the gospel everywhere. You turn the TV on, there's a gospel. You turn the radio on, there's a gospel. You turn the iPod on, there's a gospel. You turn the laptop on, the laptop on there's a gospel. Surrounded by the gospel, wet on the outside, but bone dry. In the inside. Two ways, two lives. The way of the righteous, the way of the sinner. The Bible gives us two ways, two paths, two choices, and two results. So the question is, how can we be happy? How can we be happy? What is the answer? The answer to that question is another question. What way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he said, I am the way, what did he do? He excludes all other ways. When Jesus said, I am the truth, he's, he excludes all other possibilities. When he says, I am the life, he's saying there is no other life-giving source other than me. I am the way. Which way are you on? Are you on the way of Jesus or are you on the way of the world? Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf also does not wither. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked perishes. Do you know the Lord? Does the Lord know you? In the Old Testament, the idea of knowledge, as you know, is intimate knowledge, experiential knowledge. Not knowledge in terms of philosophy or data. Yeah, I know about God, but do you know the Lord? Yeah, I know about the Bible, but do you know the Lord? Yeah, yeah, I know what the Bible says. But have you applied it to your life? Do you truly walk in the light of God's word? Do you know the Lord? Does the Lord know you? The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. Do you know the Lord? If you do not know the Lord, let me now give you an opportunity to receive him. Perhaps you are sitting on the fence, not quite sure where you are in terms of your walk. You're sitting on the fence and you're asking questions. And I'm longing for happiness. I'm longing for fulfillment and satisfaction. But for some reason, I'm unable to shake off these shackles of doubt and despair. I want to ask you this simple question. Is God the center of your life? Think about the solar system. Think of the sun. It's so massive that it exerts such a powerful force that all of the planets that revolve around the sun revolve in their particular orbits. Even the planet Pluto, way out there, revolves in its orbit. Why? Because of the gravitational force that the sun exerts. Massive, massive gravitational force. What happens if you take the sun out of the solar system? All the planets will collapse. Is God the center of the solar system of your life? If God is a center of the solar system of your life, all the planets of your life will revolve in their particular orbit. Your family, your work, your health, your relationships, your hobbies, everything will revolve in their proper orbit. You take the sun out of, away from the center, the blazing center, everything else will implode. Let's close our eyes. Maybe you are here for the first time or perhaps you've been attending church here for quite some time and you've been asking these questions. I'm longing for happiness. I'm longing for satisfaction. I'm longing to have peace in my life and restoration and redemption. We just heard what the psalm says about the portrait of happiness, about the righteous person, about the happy person. If you long to be happy and want to have full satisfaction and the peace of God in your hearts, then I invite you to let Jesus, the Prince of Peace, come into your heart and become your Savior and Lord. 
If you've never received Christ as your Lord and you're longing for happiness, He and He alone can give you true and lasting happiness. The older we grow, the more it takes to fill our hearts with happiness. And only Jesus is big enough to do it. I invite you to search your heart. If you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you now to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I've been running away from you, trying to look for happiness in the wrong places thinking that, oh, if I only have this relationship, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only have this job, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only have this marriage partner, I'll be happy. Oh, if I can only have this car, I'll be happy. Father, I come before you in the stillness of your presence, asking for your forgiveness, for I was looking for happiness in the wrong places. I come to you, Lord, and ask that you would Fill my heart with your presence. I confess my sin. I ask for your forgiveness from all sin, whether it be in thought, in word, or in deed. Cleanse me from my sin, Lord Jesus, and come and live in my heart. I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Use me as an instrument of blessing to others and be a witness for your glory. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for inviting me and giving me a hearing. I'm going to take a few moments just to worship the Lord and uh, just thank Him. Thank Him for His word. And say, Father, we just thank you that you've shown us, Lord, in your word, the way to happiness. You've shown us how we have to live life, how we have to, how we have to make this journey. I'm going to take a few moments to do that and then we will also pray before we close. Let's take a few moments. Let's thank Him. Father, we just thank You for Your Word. We ask for the grace upon our lives, not just to be hearers, but to be doers, Father. That God, for those of us here this morning, we're going to make an adjustment in our hearts as believers to understand that we are described, Lord, by what we choose to refuse. Father, we pray for grace to be imparted, God, for those of us who need to take that stand in our lives to refuse counsel that causes us to go into error, to refuse things that causes us to sit along with those who sit in the seat of the marker. Father, I pray for grace. So the Lord is speaking to you this morning right now. Just you need to make a decision in your heart. Say, God, I'm going to refuse the way of sinners. I'm going to refuse the seat of the scornful. Then do it right now in your heart. You stand before God. We are described by what we revel in. We just ask for God's grace. And God, just help me to just love your word even more. Father, we pray for grace upon our lives, causing us to love your word even more. That we will delight in the word of God, impart the grace to our hearts this morning. described by what we resemble. 
Father, we just pray for that strength, that stability. And God, the ability to stand through till we enter into that season where we bear fruit. We don't give up midway. We don't quit halfway. We know we are on the right path. Give us grace to persevere to fruitfulness. So even if you're finding it difficult, whatever you're doing, your work, maybe for those of you who are doing ministry, receive grace to keep pressing forward because you know you will bear fruit in season.
moments to pray for people's needs. It's such an honor to know the name and to sing that name and to know that in that name every sickness, disease, every work of the devil will be destroyed. Amen. So we don't just sing that name, we believe in that name. Amen. We expect things to happen in that name. So let's do that right now. So there are people here this morning. You've come in with the needs. We want to take a few moments just to pray and minister to you. It could be a physical problem in your body. Sickness, a pain, a condition. The doctors have given you their report and that's fine. Doctors have to do what they do. But Jesus said that in his name, we will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He said in his name, those who believe will cast out demons. Some of the problems we face could be demonic in nature, the oppressions in our mind, torment. But thank God we believe in that name. And Jesus is, is with us right here. So if you have a need in your life and you'd like somebody to pray with you, right where you are, there's no need to be any embarrassed. Just raise your hand. I'm going to ask people, our, our life group leaders and other ministry team, they'll come to you right where you are and pray with you. I will take a few moments just to pray from here and we'll see the Lord just minister to you and meet your needs. So if you have a need, just please raise your hand. Need prayer for healing, pray for a situation in your life or circumstance, a financial need. Just put your hand up and we'll have people come and pray with you. Just raise your hand, please, right where you are. Others, I just want you to see those who have got their hands raised. Just move to them, life group leaders. Just move across to them. Uh, just go stand one to one person and just stand with them and uh, pray with them, please. There's people here, just someone here. Anyone else at the back? I see someone way at the back. A couple of hands at the back. We need people there. Uh, just pray. Up in the balcony as well. If you have hands raised, please just life group leaders, just look around. Ministry team, look around. Uh, just go to these people. We're going to pray for them. Uh, don't be embarrassed. Just put your hand up. And I will pray from here. We just want to make sure everybody is covered. Somebody there who needs prayer. Yeah, Anita, you can stand with me. Right, everyone covered? Just raise your hand right where you are. Let's do this quickly. All right, let's pray. Just everybody else just pray and say, God, release your power. Release healing. Release miracles. Release answers to prayer. Lord, do what you would do best, which is to heal us, deliver us, set us free. Just pray. Pray in tongues. Pray in the Spirit right where you are. Just pray. Everybody pray. Let's just minister. Come and pray here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the power of your name. We thank you that you are God. You're real. You work miracles in our lives, in our circumstances, in our situations. And right now, we pray, Lord, for people right here who need healing, who need deliverance, who need a miracle, who need interventions in their lives. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your anointing flowing through us, your people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Right now, in Jesus' name, I take authority over you, devil. I take authority over your work. I take authority over your sickness, your disease, afflictions that you put on God's people. I take authority over every spirit of infirmity, every oppressing spirit, every spirit of depression, every spirit of torment, every spirit harassing people's minds. In Jesus' name, I command you, leave. I command sickness and disease to leave. And Father, in Jesus' name, release your miracle power into our bodies right now. In Jesus' name, I command bones to be healed. I command tumors and growths to disappear. I command healing in the joints that have been damaged. Release healing in the joints in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, even if it's a small condition like migraine that's recurring, 
Remove it in Jesus' name. Let it be healed in the name of Jesus. Release your healing power. I take authority over every spirit of paralysis that's, that's tormenting people's bodies. I command that to go in Jesus' name. Lord, release your power into their bodies. Even conditions that are organic in nature, I reverse what the devil's done. Let there be a recreative miracle, a creative miracle taking place in people's bodies, Father. Even if they were birth defects, let them be gone in the name of Jesus. Make your people whole, Father, in this place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know some conditions you need to go back and check, but if you feel God's touched you and there's some visible, definite evidence that God's done something for you right now, if you don't mind, raise your hand. Anybody here? Now, something's happened right now when we prayed, when people prayed with you. Something happened to you right now. There's evidence there. Anyone? God bless you, Diana. What happened, Diana? Your pain in the neck is gone. Good. God bless. Praise God for that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Something happened right now. Pain is gone in the neck. Anybody else? Some definite, clear indication of healing that took place right now. Amen. I know some things we have to go back and check, and that's fine. You do that. Amen. Amen. Let's close. Father, we give you thanks for this time in your presence. We honor you. We love you, Jesus. God, even as we go from this place, we thank you for the week that's ahead, and we pray that, God, you will use us as witnesses for your name. That wherever we go, people will see us. That we will bear testimony to your name. They will see Jesus in our lives. That in our schools, in our colleges, in our places of work, as we meet people, God, you'll use us to win souls, to destroy the devil's works wherever we see them, God. To advance your kingdom in our city and wherever we go this week. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet abiding, continuing communion of His Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Win souls, make disciples, destroy the devil's works. Have a great week. See you again next Sunday. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.